watch Caleb Scherer do battle here against Alex Smith, controlling his own destiny. And again, you never know which point it's going to be, which tournament, which match it's going to be. Is the situation different if Caleb was able to beat Tom Keating in the finals? Maybe yes, maybe no. But he's here now. He's got an opportunity to win this whole tournament and go to the Players' Championship next week in Roanoke, Virginia. We'll find out how it does shake out right now as Alex Smith is going to begin our quarterfinals with a bloodstained mire. He'll fall down to 19. And we'll see what land he wants to get here. A big credit goes to Caleb for even getting into this position. Yes. When we were talking about some of the dark horses potentially getting to the Players' Championship, Chris Anderson, Matthew Tickle, those were the players we were talking about mostly through Season 4. Caleb picked up a lot of points there at the back end, and he controls his own destiny right now. He can just win the whole thing, as you mentioned, and even a win here significantly increases his odds. It's a duress to start things off for Smith. We'll take a look at Shara's hand. There's a Warden of the First Tree. Let's make it two of those. Nana Fenza, a Den Protector, a Plains, a Wooded Foothills, and a Sunken Hollow. It's a whiff. And this is a very solid hand for sure in the matchup. I think it's important to get on the board early. When Jeskai Black gets the board clean, they just have a lot more card advantage with cards like Treasure Cruise, like Ojatai's Command, like Kologon's Command. Where Obzon Akron can get an edge in the matchup is by getting on the board first, putting some pressure on Jeskai Black before the removal is up and ready to go, and getting in some chip shots along the way. Over to Caleb, we're going to go. He'll start by sacrificing that wooded foothills. Basic four is plus the warden of the first tree is going to start things off here for Caleb. As you mentioned, it's a good start. You just want to get on the board early, start pressuring them. You don't want to give Jeskai really a lot of time to set up. But one thing, if you're Alex, that you know, given seeing Caleb's hand, no answer for Jace, no answer for Soulfire Grandmaster just yet. Yeah, it's a removal like hand. Um, a lot of people talk about, uh, you know, Atarka Red being the matchup where it's most important for Obzon Aggro to get on the board. And there's definitely an argument there. The deck's extremely fast. But at least in that matchup, cards like Anafenza and Siege Rhino have the hope of stabilizing the game on, on their own. In this kind of matchup, it's much more about just curving out efficiently than any one of your individual plays being good enough to win the game on its own. Crackling Doom, the draw here for Alex. Polluted Delta is the land he'll sacrifice. It's going to fall down to 18. You have to imagine a basic island on the way, perhaps for Jace Vrind's Prodigy. Just Guy Black just continuing to put up fantastic results in standard. Heck of a deck. A lot of different ways that you can build it. Smith's build a little bit different than others, given those monastery mentors in the main deck. There is Jace. And now the pressure is on Caleb to maybe have an answer for this. Though, a thing that you can do against Jace is you can try to overpower it with just good, solid creatures. A good curve helps a lot, because when you are putting pressure on someone, Jace flashing back a spell, well, that is only powerful if the Jeskai Black player gets to a point where they can actually cast all the spells in their hand. It's not much in the way of card advantage if you're able to kill them before they get much set up. It's a snapping Narla to follow up, so the old 1-2 here for Caleb to get things started. Smith will draw a card. You'll note with his mana, basic island, basic swamp. You'll find that a card like Crackling Doom off the table right now. Not going to be able to be cast. Does have a roast in hand. Smoldering Marsh will enter the battlefield untapped right now as well. Smith's going to start by activating Jace. He'll draw a card and discard here in just a moment. Picked up another copy of Jace. You can see the mana a little wonky out of the gates here for Smith. I don't believe he has access to white mana right now with two copies of Crackling Doom, which is probably why you're seeing him loot right now, because he wants to leave Jace in play as a looter for next turn rather than flipping right now. Crackling Doom going to go down. If you're Caleb, that's notable. You can pick up a little bit of information there. If he's just got a crackling doom, he's probably having some issues with Thana. There's Smoldering Marsh. Here comes Fiery Impulse. Take care of the Snapping Gnarlid. And now we'll head back over to Cher. He'll take a draw. His hand is filling out pretty nicely. Does have a copy of Gideon in hand. Snapping Gnarlid demanded an answer. So that got taken care of. And Gideon is a very problematic card for Alex Smith's list. No copies of Utter End in the main deck. Now, we've seen some players here this weekend, some number of Utter Ends, Salumgar's Command, just a way to handle the Planeswalkers. Typically, Manus Rider checks that type of card, but Manus Rider is really kind of vanished from these decks. Yeah, Monastery Mentor is kind of filling that slot. It's a little bit more synergistic with a deck full of spells, but uh, Smith is 
not well equipped to answer Gideon at least game one. And defense of the foremost is the turn three play here for Caleb. And as I mentioned, one of the ways that you can kind of overpower just guy black is just presenting threats every single turn. Yes. There's a roast, which means that offense is toast. And now we're going to head back Caleb's way. Smith perhaps looking to block with the Jace loot and flip. Here comes the warden. There's a block. Will Caleb pump? Seems like a poor use of the turn unless he has literally nothing else to do with his mana. Although I guess at some point he has to force the issue. Jace gets to fog a large blocker at some point. Well, here's a copy of Lantern Waste. No pump. Follow up here for Caleb. Looks to be another Warden. Could also play a Den Protector face down if you'd like. It looks like he might have a third Warden. And he does. So now simply pass the turn back with the mana to activate one of these Wardens and, and bring it up to level one, which will make it a 3-3. And this is a great start here. A lot of pressure on the board for Caleb. Uh, he's going wide, which is valuable against this deck with a lot of spot removal. And the leftovers in hand are not shabby. So Gideon can't cast it right now. And a Den Protector that I think he wants to wait until he has land number five to do everything in one turn. But a good presence on the board. Smith struggling a little bit with his mana right now. And sure his leftovers, very good for the matchup. We don't see this happen a ton with Just Guy Black, especially when they have Jace involved. But it, it is a four-color deck at the end of the day. Yes. I mean, it, you have your mana at some point, but you don't necessarily have it right away. And you have to pick and choose. And when you pick between Duress, Jace, and Red Removal, good chance you're going to be missing your white for a bit. One Warden is up to level one. That's what the die will signify. If we do put a counter on top of the Warden, that'll be a plus one, plus one counter. Above it or below it is for what level it is on, for clarification at home. Now Caleb is going to come into the red zone here. I believe Sure picked up a flooded strand this turn, which is perfect. It's land number five, and it's white source of mana number two. And you said it. Gideon is a very hard card for Alex Smith to be able to beat. This will be an activation of Jace after blocking the 3-3 Warden. Smith will draw and discard here. And keep in mind that deck lists are public at this point as well. So Sure knows there's no copy of Utter End. There's no main deck negate. There's no clean answer for a Gideon and Smith's list. Okay, we're going to deal two. Now here is that flooded strand. He'll sacrifice that. Perhaps a canopy vista on the way. But Gideon finally going to enter the battlefield, it looks like. And this is going to be tough here for Alex Smith because he's working with not a lot of mana, which means he's probably still in one spell per turn territory. Yep. And if he's only casting one spell per turn, it doesn't really matter if that spell is coming out of the hand or if it's being flashed back via Jace. This is why it's so important to put pressure on. It's the, it's the best way to take the sting out of the card advantage sources that are in the Jeskai Black deck. There's Gideon. He'll start on four. I think we'll have a Knight Ally join in just a moment here. And with Caleb putting on as much pressure as he's putting on right now, Smith not having a turn last turn, essentially, just playing his shambling vent and passing, uh, that might be too much for him to overcome. The board might have already gotten out of control for him. And there's that Knight Ally. And pass the turn back, Will Smith. Excuse me, we'll share over to Smith. Smith's got an active Jace, five counters. He has found land here in Sunken Hollow. It will enter the battlefield untapped, given the two basics. But there's not a lot going on here. Two copies of Crackling Doom in hand, along with another copy of Jace, it appears. And now here is Crackling Doom. Going to take down the larger warden, not Gideon down to two. Jace is going to go up. Wants to slow a little something down here, but if you're Caleb as you're untapping, your Gideon's still alive. Mm -hmm. Sure, one of your creatures has been lessened a little bit, and now there's a backup Jace. Now your opponent's tapped out. You have free reign on the turn. Exactly. It wouldn't surprise me here for sure to, to plus the Gideon and try to pressure Jace a little bit this turn, both to get Jace off the table and to get Gideon up to three loyalty, because Smith with Colgon's command and Crackling Doom in his deck may be able to kill Gideon at two loyalty next turn. If he's able to find a card like Obzon Charm, Dramoka's Command, some sort of spell now, 
You know, the green light's on on that. Don't have to worry about duress, dispel, any of the counter magic, any removal kind of blowing it up. So we'll see what the turn does yield here for Caleb. The other route that Shur can take here is because the last card in his hand is a den protector, he can also say, all right, I'm going to try to make some more tokens, continue to go wide. If Smith wants to use his turn getting Gideon off the table, that's OK. I can simply den protector it back. For Caleb, this game seems very well in hand. I like his positioning here. You can tell that Smith is struggling a little bit. And I think, again, what reflected that the most was the discard of Crackling Doom early in the game, because it's such a useful resource in this particular matchup, especially a check in Gideon. Yes. He needs that kind of card. So for Caleb, you can probably pick up on that and say, hey, I'm in a pretty good spot right now. Let's try to cross the finish line as best I can. And that might involve making Gideon to a 5-5 attacker. So that's coming in along with the two Wardens, which can pump at a moment's notice. Sure, still has an incentive, though, to try to get Smith dead as soon as possible. Absolutely. You don't want the game to go on for a very long time, especially against someone with two copies of Treasure Cruise in their deck, along with Soulfire, Grandmaster, Monastery, Mentor, these cards that could turn the game around very quickly. So I think it's important to try to get Jace off the table, but also uh, sure needs to keep the pressure up on Smith's life total. The question, of course, is what's the best way to get him dead? Is the best way to get him dead to Scrutter's life total, or is the best way to get him dead to nuke his resources, which means taking care of Jace? The problem is that with the second Jace in play, sure then starts having an incentive to just say, OK, I'm going to go after your life total. I can't get both Jace's off the table. I don't want to spend the time and energy and damage I could be dealing to you trying to get your flip chase off the table when that's likely to die next turn when you flip over your Vin's Prodigy. Well, there's the attack. No blocks here for Smith, no good ones to make, and he's going right after Smith's life total. Alex is going to fall down to five. It's a morph to follow up. We know that's a dent protector. Alex likely knows that as well. Now, Smith does have Crackling Doom as a hypothetical answer to Gideon as well. Yep. But Anytime Smith's representing that kind of mana, sure can simply say, make a token. Yeah. He doesn't have to play into it if he doesn't want to. Smith will draw a card. Looks like he may have picked up a copy of Ojitai's command for the turn. Abzan, not the flashiest deck you'll ever see, but good creatures, good mana. It's always been a winning recipe in Magic. That's exactly what this deck does have. Powerful cards, good creatures, good mana. A couple good spells, too. Some things to do if you go long, ways to play well in the short game. It's robust, it's flexible. For Alex Smith, you saw the Ojitai's command as the draw, Crackling Doom still in the hand, and a graveyard to work with. Jace is going to go down to three. Looks like Fiery Impulse an option, and now he'll activate this chase. Polluted Delta the draw. Down goes Crackling to him. Again, notable. So I think the, the point here is that Smith needs that land and the Ojitai's command to get out of this turn. Because yeah. it's flashing back here. Going to take care of the Warden. Spell Mastery is certainly achieved. Now for Caleb. And again, the deck list are public, so you know what your opponent's working with. It's time to start checking off those boxes. He's got one card left in hand. What could he have left? Yeah, the, the risk is if that last card. I, I suppose Smith's list from this position, there is, uh, there is a second Smoldering Marsh. So he could hypothetically use the Delta to fetch for red and represent Crackling Doom as the last card in his hand. And he does have a Shambling Vents within the lands as well. Yes. But the Crackling Doom is really the most significant card from Shurer's side, because this is a pretty attractive spot to just plus Gideon and keep shipping in. Mm -hmm. But your opponent just ca just discarded a Crackling Doom and played a Polluted Delta. Yeah. So it sort of suggests the last card in his hand could be that Crackling Doom. It is interesting the information you can try to draw from this scenario. 
It looks like Gideon's going to go up to four, though. I guess the reason to largely ignore it is Schur has a pretty powerful hedge here against Crackling Doom being the last card, which is just Dem Protector back to Gideon, recast it, make a token, say go. Now your opponent's empty-handed with just a Jason play, and you have a huge board presence. And he's got the six mana to do all that, too. Yeah. So then come the Morph, the Warden, which is a 1-1 right now. No level on that. Gideon has a 5-5, five, five, of course, and the Knight Ally is a 2-2. Two, two. And they're not attacking Jace. They're attacking you, Alex Smith. Delta going to be sacrificed. And note that the Morph, I believe, was targeted by Jace. Smith going to fall down to 4. There's that Smoldering Marsh. One of the things you have to do as a player when you are kind of taking a look over the deck list, typically you just look over the cards, the instants, and see what they are. But you actually have to, in this particular format, especially against Jeskai Black, know what lands they can find. Well, I think no deck is more about that in the top eight than Joel Assets. Sure. I mean, his mana base is, there's a lot of singletons, and there's spots where certain lands can be fetched out of the deck where, oh, that Flooded Strain actually can't get blue mana right now. That yeah. kind of stuff comes up a lot with Lissette's deck, so very important for all the decks, but his in particular, to make sure uh, you're conscious of the mana they can get. It's Ochai's command. Gain four, get back Jason. Jamoka's man was the draw. Time to fight. Kill that Jace. Don't let it block, and that'll get the job done. Caleb Sher is going to win game number one here over Alex Smith. Hobbs on aggro. Up a game over Jeskai Black. Great start here for Caleb. And that means we're going to take a look at the sideboards here for both players. We're going to start with Alex Smith and his two dispels. A negate, two master of the unseen, a duress, two dragonlord ochatai, two Russian cleric, two radiant flames, two self-inflicted wound, and an erase. A lot of options here for Alex. So the two copies of self-inflicted wound are, are just strong answer cards to Shurer's threats. I think he needs to bring in the additional copy of Duress and the additional copy of Negate to give himself more answers to Gideon, which was such a problematic card in game number one, as you saw. This also seems like a fine magic for, matchup for Dragonlord Ojitai. Sure, it doesn't block flyers all that well, and him having to leave in removal for that card is a little awkward. For the other side of things for Caleb, he's, uh, he's taking the Logan Mize tech. The Pitiless Hordes, he's got four of those. Three Duress, two Painful Truths, two self Lincoln Wound, two Planner Outburst, and then two Rising Marasma. I think you're going to see the three copies of Duress come in. Uh, I think Smith, in this matchup, sure, is enough of the aggressor that I think the Pitiless Hordes can come in as well. And the game's going to be going on for a long time, so Painful Truths should be coming in for longer games. Well, there's the options there for both players. They'll shuffle up, get ready to go. If we do have an update for you guys in our back -up match, we'll certainly let you know. I think the Rising Miasma is, it's not... A disaster here? I mean, you look at Smith's creature base, it's four copies of Jace, four copies of Soulfire Grandmaster, three copies of Monastery Mentor. You'd imagine it'd be okay here, but I think the matchup is more about sure getting his curve going, and Rising Miasma is more for trying to be decks like Atarka Red, Black White Soldiers, and so forth. It's not out of the realm of possibility that he would bring in here, but if I was in his seat, I would try to focus on being as aggressive as possible. SCG Game Night is what we're talking about now before game number two is underway, where you can Get a reindeer here this month, some new stuff here in January and February, but of course a very popular promotion thanks to you guys at home for playing in it. You can head over to starcitygames.com slash gamenet for more information. Store knows you can contact your Starcity Games in-store play representative. Every month we come out with new kits with pins and tokens that you can give out to players at your store. Game night can be run any day of the week, any format that you want. Just get players in the store on a regular basis for some fun and friendly magic. The December kit is what's live right now. That's the reindeer. We have announced our next two kits, which is the Grizzly brand in January and February magazine the move. So again, head over to starcygames.com slash game night for more information. Contact your Starcy Games in-store play representative. Canadian store owners, we have changed the shipping rates. We now just ch charge U.S. domestic shipping to send these kits out to Canada. So if you have not brought game nights to your store because of the shipping costs, again, contact your Starcy Games in-store play representative. Get set up today. Game number two about to be underway here between Alex Smith and Caleb Scherer. Caleb Scherer is the talk of the tournament. Three and three. Three and three. Sometimes I just want to give up when I'm three and three. I, I was calling early in the tournament that, you know, now it's Eric Hawkins or bust. Yeah. I just assumed, you know, I'd written him off three and three. How's he going to make top eight for that position? Now we just see if one of Eric Hawkins' horses can win the whole thing and maybe he sneaks in the Players' Championship. Now it's uh, Hawkins is the least likely of the two. He needs Caleb to lose this match here and have Lissette win the whole thing. Yep. It was interesting, you know, just kind of hearing the rumblings on the floor. It's like, oh, Caleb is five and three now. He's six and three, and Nick Miller coming over. He's eight and three. He's nine and three, and now he's ten and three, and he's not losing anymore. And now he's into the top eight, and now he's up a game. 
a great run under any set of circumstances. Yes. And uh, particularly given the opportunity that's opened up for him now to qualify for the Players' Championship, either by winning this whole thing or by catching some breaks on with Joe Lissette's matches. Uh, what a run. And it's going to be a lot of fun to watch these next couple of games unfold here. It's been a year-long kind of quest here for Caleb. And I think about in the middle of the year, during the back end of the year, number 17 was always next to his name. Yep. Always with one by in the, in the Open Series events instead of two. Uh, which is a, a world of difference for anyone who's ever played buys, who's ever had buys at a tournament. He finally worked his way to two in Denver last weekend because of his finished New Jersey, so he never even really got to take advantage of two buys. And you get no buys at this thing, so he's got he's had to do it the hard way. But he's certainly making the most of the weekend. Yeah. The, uh, what, what a run even just to get to this position. Yeah. And the day's not over. Uh, I think he's going to have a long day in front of him. One of these players will, whoever walks out of here with the victory. Alex Smith will be on the play. We'll see what he can put together this game. Again, Jeskai Black, a very powerful deck. I think no one would argue otherwise, but sometimes that money, that mana, excuse me, can really just mess with you. Yeah, and it doesn't matter that much in the slower matchups because you can be a little slow out of the gates. Usually when you're missing a color, you're choosing between, all right, I'm not going to play this two-mana creature for a while, or maybe I'll lose access to one of my removal spells as these players pile shuffle for the seventh time. <laughs> yes. Get used to me complaining about that over the course of the day. Yes. But in the matchups, uh, in matchups like this, it's very important for Smith, and the Atarka Red matchup is, is much the same thing, it's very important for Smith to have access to everything early on in the game because he can't really miss a beat if Schurer's draw is aggressive. And with multiple copies of Ward of the First Tree and his good top end of Gideon plus Den Protector, uh, Smith never really got his footing under him in that match, even though he had an uncontested chase for the whole game. Well, that game one draw is kind of how I would draw it up if, I, if I'm Caleb. That's the kind of draw I want. I don't know if I want three Wardens, but I just want to get to the board early and often. Yes. That's really all I want. Maybe a spell here and there, but that's a thing of beauty for me. I'm happy with that kind of draw. Just pressure him. It kind of ignore Jace if you can. If your hand allows you to, ignore Jace and just get to work that way. Yep. Uh, you, Jace only really matters if someone has the, the time to leverage all the spells out of the graveyard. And uh, Smith never really got to that point. He was in the back foot the whole game. The Gideon was worth several cards as well. I mean, it looked like Smith was the only one generating card advantage, but uh, sure as Gideon was worth quite a bit as well. We have an update for you guys in a backup match. Casey Portes does win game number one here over Michael Cortez. Casey Portes, our number two overall seed with four color rally. Up a game over Michael Cortez, number seven overall seed with Esper Midrange. Keep in mind, Portes, Cortez, Scherer, and Smith all on the same side of the bracket. Mm -hmm. So whoever does win the match between Portes and Cortez will be battling between Scherer and Smith. Both players take a look at the opener here. Smith will be on the play. Let's see if he can find a hand that he likes. He's good to go. For Caleb. He's going to keep as well. It's a polluted delta to start things off. You can see that Smith has brought in his copies of Dragon Lord Ojitai, one in his opening hand. If I'm Alex, if my opponent's fetching on turn one, I'm not thrilled. Yeah, and Smith would really like sure to just pass on the first turn. Yep. Play a shambling vent. Do something that's not a ward in the first tree to get to the board. But, you know, that's also a thing where this is kind of how Caleb's deck is built. He's got a more aggressive slant to his build. Yeah, he's only got four one-drops in the ward, but he's got Snapping Gnarled. He's got Den Protectors he can play face up. He's looking to get to the board early with how his deck is built. Yeah, and I, I think this is a matchup where Snapping Gnarled's quite a bit better than Air of the Wilds, which is a card you sometimes see in the spot. Death Touch is not a key word that matters a whole lot against Smith's list, but just power to mana ratio is is what you're looking for, and Snapping Gnarled's the better threat of the two for those kind of matchups. Smoldering Marsh, the land found there by Smith with the polluted Delta. There's an island. It's Jace again. Caleb was able to overpower this last game. We'll see if he can do that yet again. He'll draw a card. He'll sacrifice a flooded strand. Down to 18, he'll go. I think we've got a planes on the way. All right. 
Sure, his man has really cooperated with him thus far. He had a little bit of a hiccup there in game one, not having double white on four, but basic, basic into battle land starts with Warden. That's a big silk wrap. Get that Jace off the battlefield, come across here for one point of damage, pass the turn back. You know, last game, Caleb's draw allowed him to overpower Jace just by playing a really good creature every single turn. But I don't know if you want to try to pass that test every time. No, it, the easiest thing to do is to kill it. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's the easy way. The overpowering, especially on the draw, can happen. Uh, but that was helped in large part because Smith was having some issues with his colored mana. Uh, the easiest thing to do is just get it off the table, especially if you can exile it. It's another copy of Jace here for Smith. You see the hand, polluted delta. Among the lands, Dragonlord Ojatai, there's a Crackling Doom, Bloodstained Mire as well. He's going to play a Mire and simply pass the turn back over to Cher. Caleb will take a draw step here. He'll come across for at least one, maybe more than that. We'll see. No blocks predictably, so one damage will be dealt. Time to see what the follow-up's going to be. Land of War Waste is land number three. And that's an offense at number one. So again, Caleb doing a nice job of doing something on the early turns of the game. Getting the ball rolling early, putting Alex Smith under pressure. Alex going to sacrifice a Bloodstain Mire. We'll see what Landy wants to search up. We'll go with a basic mountain. The funny thing to me as I think about it right now, you know, we always talk about during shows and other times as well, just what, what deck would you want to play in standard right now? I know you're, you're partial to Tarka Red. Yes. Um, I like Todd's build of Jeskai Black or a Tarka Red. Sometimes I think about playing Four Color Rally. What, for whatever reason, I, I never even think about playing Abbas on Aggro. Well, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I just don't. You've gotten desensitized to the cards because you've seen all of them together for a year and change now. So that's part of it. You like trying out the new stuff. Uh, and the deck looks so much different than the dominant build of Obzon from last year. But there is still a lot to be said for this deck. This deck's great. It's simple and straightforward. It's not flashy, but it, it's very good. And we see it win so much. There's a Prairie Stream off of Pluto Delta. Smith's going to fall down to 15. Access to Crackling Doom now. Three cards in the graveyard for Jace, by the way. And Gideon is not spectacular in every single matchup. But there are a lot of decks that struggle to interact with that card. That, that, to me, is a big incentive. I think this might be the best Gideon deck. And Gideon is an exceptional card in a lot of matchups. Fiery Impulse, the draw. Crackling Doom going to go to the graveyard. And there's a Monastery Mentor. And now I'm just going to pass the turn back with Fiery Impulse at the ready. Interesting to see Alex willingly discard Crackling Doom here in this spot. Has the mana to cast it? Well, he has the he has the fiery impulse, which is very good in an immediate sense. He has another copy of Crackling Doom in hand, but he can't Crackling Doom and fiery impulse this turn. So his hand sort of forced to Monastery Mentor plus fiery impulse. And the last card in his hand is a Dragonlord Ojutai, which is probably the most powerful card he has in his sideboard. So it's a little awkward, but uh, I think given the circumstances, it was the right card to discard. The counter on Warden from Anafenza looks like it's going to resolve. I think it would be very different if Smith could cast Crackling Doom and Fiery Impulse in the same turn. I think at that point he might discard Monastery Mentor. But because he didn't have access to that turn, he's only got two red sources of mana, and one of the red sources of mana is his only black source of mana. This is the route he has to take instead. Cher, looks like he's going to go get a Canopy Vista. A little unsure of himself, but that's what he'll find with the Wooded Foothills as he falls down to 16. And if he's got a four mana spell here, no matter which one it is, it's pretty good. Yeah, and this is another way to overwhelm. Uh, the best ways to overwhelm Jace and Monastery Mentor is just doing things like this. Yep. Here's a big play on curve, another big play on curve, another big play on curve, and hope that uh, all that overwhelms you before you can really leverage your better cards. Fire Impulse is going to take down the Warden of the first tree. And a Monk token will be made. That, of course, is our Season 1 
Invitational Champion Jacob Wilson. We'll see him next weekend in Roanoke. to Jace activation. Bloodstained Mire, the draw of the discard. We'll find out here in just a moment. That'll be a, a copy of Fiery Impulse. So now Jace will transform into the Telepath Unbound. Five counters is where it starts. Looks like it's going to go up to six. You can see Smith wanting to keep his fifth land and copy of Dragon Lord Ojitai and most likely cast Crackling Doom this turn. Targeting Anafenza will bring Anafenza down to a two power creature. And now you cast Crackling Doom. Biggest creature out there is a Siege Rhino. Always a difficult card for Jeskai decks to beat. Given the trample. So down goes the Rhino. Another monk is made. And now here's a pretty healthy attack given the prowess triggers. Those shields are down. Conceivable that Smith could even get killed on the way back here. Anafenza the draw here for Caleb. Caleb does have a copy of Pitiless Horde in hand. What Caleb needs to be a little careful of is he could die on the way back. Yes. Just th this, play this turn, last turn from Smith was not without risk. There's a shambling vet. Looks like Caleb does have Gideon in hand again. He'll play Gideon. Knight ally on the way. And now it's going to go back to Alex Smith. Monastery mentor, a monk token, going to sacrifice Bloodstain Mire on the upkeep. And that Jace telepath unbound on six counters. A lot that Smith can do this turn as he falls to five. I'm imagining here that if Smith is sacking straight away when his life total is a little tight, that his plan is here is to plus Jace and just cast Dragonlord Ojatai. I thought it was possible that instead he would just flash back the Crackling Doom, get rid of the Anafenza, maybe pressure Gideon a little, bit, a little bit more, maybe pressure Sure a little bit more. But if he's sacking ahead of time, I suspect he's just going to cast Dragonlord Ojatai this turn. Because I don't think thinning out your deck is worth the one point in this spot unless you're confident with what you're doing going into your turn. You mentioned the Dragon Lodge tie in hand. Maybe that'll be entering the battlefield here in just a moment. The concern I have there is I'm not convinced that Dragon Lord Ojatai is better this turn than just casting Crackling Doom. You have the larger start off the table and you can make some inroads on Gideon and get another monk for your trouble. Uh, Dragon Lord Ojatai is uh, a pretty risky play. It'll be a minus three on Jace. Crackling Doom going to be recast. A monk token on the way. And offensive down. Gideon going to fall down to two. And it's almost trivial to clean up Gideon now. We'll see where the attackers do go here for Smith. Yeah, it looks like Gideon down. Pass the turn back. I think Smith's draw step might have been Murderous Cut, which is perfect here. It's a good trap. If the plan here for Caleb is Pitiless Horde to try to rumble over for the win, it's a nice trap. Get another Monk token and a Prowess Trigger to trade for your trouble. Here's an attack for two. And there's a cut. Another monk on the way. Quick update for you guys in our other match. Michael Cortez with his Esper mid-range deck. Heavy theme on exiling. Does tie things up against Casey Portis and his four-color rally deck. And offensive here for Caleb. And offense is a risky play here because I believe it leaves Caleb dead on board to a flashback of Crackling Doom. So the Crackling Doom is worth six points, essentially. Four prowess triggers plus the two, plus seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven with what's already in play. That would be Xaxes. The 
Roast isn't bad either. Peeling roast makes it a lot easier. Yep. It's time for beatdowns. This will be nine points. And now Smith is going to cash in the Jays for the crack and new, and that's going to do it. So Alex Smith is going to win game number two here over Caleb Scherer. Jess Guy Black going to tie things up here against Opson Agro. Monster Mentor, a very important tool there for Smith to stabilize that game. I don't think he could have done it just through removal spells. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think the ability to actually kill things and generate pressure all in one card there with the Mentor, pretty important stuff. Yeah, it, it's nice for Smith to be in a position with that card where he can flip the script, turn the game around and pressure pretty quickly. Uh, also can lock up the ground as he goes. Monster and Mentor unchecked trumps Gideon pretty easily and Gideon's one of the tougher cards for Smith to answer the matchup. Well, as Alex Smith will take a moment to get ready here for game number three because, well, it's the best of five, so this is going to be a pretty long day for everybody here playing some Magic. Going to have to refocus and realign, realign things. We will talk about the StarCityGames.com holiday sale taking place here this month, December 1st to January 1st. We've got cool specials all month long. Yeah, and we update the website every day, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. So make sure to check back every single day as there will be new sales going up on the website. Right now, we're running up to 20% off select promo lands. You can see on the screen there a variety of arena, APAC, expedition lands all on sale right now. Also, throughout the entire month, we'll have stocking stuff for sales on things like deck boxes, sleeves, and extended art lands. Again, go back to the website every single day during the week, Monday through Friday, throughout the month of December, as there will be new sales each day. Game number three, about to be underway. Caleb Scherer looking to, I would say, create a little bit of history here with one crazy comeback if he's able to pull it off. Yes. I mean, this, this is a big one, and especially given his start to the day at three and three, looked like he was dead to rights. And if you try, if you go back even a month earlier, how far he was out of the Players' Championship race, to be in this position is incredible. We barely even talked about him because we didn't think he'd be able to make the sort of comeback necessary. He was kind of keeping pace, but it just looked like Chris Anderson, given the tear that he was on, he was the one that might be able to pull this off. Maybe Eric Hawkins, Matthew Tickle, who knew? But Caleb Scherer, 27 years old from St. Louis, Missouri, this will be a second Invitational Top 8. He's got some open series top eights on the resume as well. Typically think of him as a legacy guy, given his performances with Storm and Legacy, but now showing that he can do it across all formats. Obzon Agro, certainly helpful for that in standard, really been his weapon of choice. And I think the metagame is ripe right now for an aggressive deck with Gideon, just given how many decks are, are light on answers. And in the, uh, in the case of Alex Smith's, almost no answers. I mean, he's got some duresses in his deck, he can get it preemptively. He's got a negate in his sideboard. Crackling Doom and Colgon's command can manage it over the course of several turns, but uh, Smith's deck is, is not happy to see this card. And there's a lot of decks we had on camera this weekend where you can say the same thing. Now, we saw Caleb there bring in at least one, one Pitiless Horde. How do we feel about that card in the matchup? I, I like it for Caleb, even though um, it does look bad in the games involving Monastery Mentor. Yeah. That, that's, uh, that goes without saying. But I think that sure does need to be the aggressor in the matchup. I think that's the angle he's got to take. And even though Smith can pressure his life total, we saw in that game he was able to flip things around very quick with Monastery Mentor. Uh, any card that allows Sure to be more aggressive, uh, I'm interested in. And I talked during the sideboarding about the copies of Painful Truths. I'm not even sure those cards should be coming in. I, I think post-board games typically slow down, and you can imagine that card just going to be pretty good and pretty powerful in general, but I don't know if it's worth pulling away from Sure's aggression. You know, what are you cutting? All this deck is good threats. The removal spells are all solid here. I guess Obzon Charm can go pretty easily. There's nothing really for that card to exile uh, besides Monastery Mentor in some spots. But uh, I think it's going to be a challenge to make room for both Pitiless Horde and Painful Truths. If you assume Duress is coming in, I think Duress is very important. I, I think Duress is very likely to come in. Yeah, we haven't seen Caleb or Logan last week and get into a match where Pitiless Horde can really shine. It's those Esper matchups, I think, where that card's really at its best. Well, with the information on the deck list and, and knowing that, that Smith is very aggressive, doesn't really pressure outside of Monster and Mentor, no copies of Manus Rider, 
I like it for this matchup. Even though I don't think you're bringing it against every build of chess guy. The Manus Rider ones that are a bit more aggressive, I think that one probably stays in your deck box. Well, we got our backup match. If we do have time to jump that way, Casey Portis, Michael Cortez. They're tied up at one to one right now, just like Caleb Shearer and Alex Smith are. That's four color rally in the hand of Casey Portez and Esper Midrange in the hands of Michael Cortez. That Esper Midrange deck, maybe the most interesting one in the top eight here this week. And I think we're all used to Joe Lissette's five color bring the light deck now. But this Esper Midrange deck, with all the exiling that's going on, a very different build. I mean, it's. Uh, I this is very close to a list, if not the actual list that Craig Wesco played. So it's not without historical precedent. I ran into this in Magic Online. You have Stasis Snare plus Silk Wrap to enable Wasteland Strangler. You have a bunch of the good white mid-range threats in the format. And Gideon and Wingmate Rock, several decks of the format are vulnerable to one of those cards, if not both. So you have that in the Esper deck and Caleb Sure also with two copies of Wingmate Rod in his list this weekend, alongside three Gideons. For a while, that combination of cards, Gideon into Wingmate Rock, was something that defined the format. Mm -hmm. I think we've moved away from that a little bit, but there was a, it felt like a two-week stretch where turn four Gideon, turn five Wingmate Rock, well, this game's over. But I think if you're going to be playing with Waymate Rock, it's very important to be pressuring your opponent. I would be apprehensive about playing with five mana creatures in a format where one of the defining cards is Ojitai's Command, because then you're getting Cryptic Commanded sometimes and you're down on mana. But if you're able to put enough pressure on your opponent that they don't have the luxury of leaving up four mana, then you can get your Waymate Rock to resolve and everything's good. That's why cards like Ward of the First Tree and Snapping Gnarlet are so important here for sure in the matchup. It allows him to get the pressure on that forces Smith to respond. That allows Shurer to stick his really powerful threats in the matchup like Gideon and Wingmate Rock. Well, it'll be Caleb Shearer on the play. These players will shuffle each other's decks and then they will be underway. If you are just joining us, Cedric Phillips, Patrick Sullivan here in the booth, being, bringing you the top eight the quarterfinals of our season four invitational. Someone's walking out of here with $10,000, their likeness on a card, an invite to our first invitational next year in Columbus. And of course, an invite to the Players' Championship next weekend in Roanoke, Virginia. We've got 15 of the players figured out for that tournament. We just gotta figure out who number 16 is gonna be. And we'll go over those players after this game is over. Will Caleb keep his opening hand? Looks like the answer is no. For Alex Smith. Perhaps he's going to think about it a little bit. Looks like lands and spells to me. A reasonable <laughs> mixture. Fire Impulse and Crackling Doom, assuming he has access to the right colors of man. I can't imagine this one going back, especially with Sure on six cards. Six cards here now for Caleb. See if he likes these, and if so, he'll get the scry with the Vancouver Mulligan rule. Caleb going to keep. Take a look at the top. It's Warden again. So big, especially this time for the first time in the matchup, Caleb on the play. And even in something like, like Warden influences the lands that Smith has, if he has a fiery impulse, instead of getting a dual lane here and fixing his mana, he may feel the need to just fiery impulse this right away. When you speak of fiery impulse, he does have one of those, and his draw for the turn was Bloodstained Mire, so that situation comes to fruition right away. He can play the Bloodstained Mire if he wants to. Shock if Caleb passes and get a dual land if he fails to do so. He also may want to just kill it straight away. Well, he's going to sacrifice Bloodstained Mire. I think he's going to kill it straight away. Yeah, that's the sense I'm getting to. And you can see his curve in hand. He has um, a Plains and Soulfire Grandmaster, and I believe another dual land plus Painful Truths. So when you're on the draw with Painful Truths, you just want to cast the stuff in your hand, because if you don't, you're very likely to discard a hand size. So. Make a play on one, make a play on two, gas back up on three. Very good start for Smith. 
It's at the cost of a little bit of life, but that might be okay. Well, if you're blooding insurer's aggression and you're playing a lifelink threat on two, uh, you may be able to handle that. Sharer gonna draw. Snapping Gnarlids in hand. He'll sacrifice a flooded strand. Planes on the way. And old Snaps is gonna come on in. In a moment here, we'll move back Alex Smith's way. We'll see what his draw step will yield. Again, there's a lot of different two drops this deck can play. Rikshasha Death Dealer we saw in the past. We've seen Air of the Wilds as well. Caleb opting for Snapping Gnarlet, however. I think Death Dealer is very taxing on this mana base. I mean, this is a green-white deck touching just a little bit of black. It has Gideon, and I think trying to fetch black mana early on in the game means that you have to get a dual land tap, which is not something you want to be doing when you have Warden in your deck. Smoldering Marsh. Got to end the battlefield on tap. Narlo's going to come across here for three points of damage. Smith's going to fall down to 16. Does Sharer have a solid follow-up? That's the question. We've seen Anna Fence on turn three each game here from Caleb. Looks like it's just going to be a duress. Murderous Cut, Crackling Doom, Painful Truths. Mystic Monastery and a Polluted Delta. That's the hand there for Alex Smith. It's a pretty gosh darn good one. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a curve of some removal spells and a draw three to gas back up. You almost feel like Caleb might be forced to take the painful truths and weather the storm of removal spells, but that's also a tough way to do it. Curious what card is supposed to take here. I almost kind of want to take Painful Truth and try to try to work through the two removal spells, but that's that's not easy. With Smith likely to be getting some life here, I don't think you'd be damage racing quite yet in this spot. The the draw three is just too much. Okay. Another snapping Narlin, so another threat at least. Pass the turn back over to Smith. Smith will draw. Another copy of Murderous Cut. Not great in multiples. Still going to be plenty fine. Yeah. There's Polluted Delta. I assure you by the time this game is over, Smith will not have complained about drawing the second copy of Murderous Cut. Fair enough. If the first one is Swords to Plowshares, then if the second one has to be Murder, Murder is still fine against a deck with a bunch of three and four mana creatures. There are worse fates. Sunken Hollow going to be found here by the Polluted Delta. There is the Crackling Doom. Snapping Narla down. Smith is going to gain two life, of course, thanks to the Soulfire Grandmaster. And now we head back over to Cher. He'll come across here for two. No land even play. Does he have a spell? He does an Anafensa. Now pass the turn back over to Smith. Smith going to draw. Picked up a copy of Vojtai's command. There's Mystic Monastery. Looks like it's time for a murderous cut. Gonna delve away the lands. So this one's two mana and the next one's one mana. So <laughs> still, pretty, still worked out okay. Pretty good card. <laughs> I would love to just tally up all the delve cards in Constark here and see what percentage of them appeared in winning deck lists. I think the answer would be quite a few. I was outside talking with Huey Jensen yesterday. We we're trying to think of the ones that didn't show up. It's like the 3-3 three, three flyer. Set adrift. Set adrift. The Grave Digger, but only because I think that because Angler and Tassiger are cards, the Grave Digger would have showed up if those cards didn't exist. The hit rate's pretty good on that mechanic. It's not bad. It's not bad. Cher will draw. He's attacking. What's the follow up? The Warden's not bad here. Got some mana to sink into it. However, Ochtai's command is going to take care of that. So, counter and draw. Smith will draw now. And his deck is humming along pretty good right now. 
And land number five now sets the stage for murderers cut with the buybacks. Mm -hmm. It's getting tough. Murderers cut also for one mana, and then maybe it's two mana the, the third time you cast it. I, think. I don't know. Yeah. You, you start paying something approaching a reasonable mana cost <laughs> for it, like the third time. <laughs> Here comes Soulfire Grandmaster. Sure is going to fall down to 10. Smith up to 16. Four is the draw here, I believe. Here's an attack for two. Sure, I think not playing the land before combat to try to bluff like it's not land number five and we mate rock to try to get that raid trigger. I like it. I think you have to do it. Unfortunately, these are all just going to be terminated with buyback. <laughs> But at least Sure made a stab at it. You know, he plays the land before combat, and then Smith's got to go, okay, what's the, what if the last card is we mate rock? When you just attack first, okay, there's probably not a land in his hand. He would have played it before combat, so I could ignore we mate rock and allow this thing to attack. It's a good shot. It's just not going to matter against terminate with buyback. And then buyback again. And then, yeah, then, and then buyback again. Yeah. Murder's got a pretty good magic card. Give the old college try. You know, you got to appreciate the effort, but... Gonna activate the Soulfire Grandmaster, which means Murderous Cut will have buyback. It'll come on back. What we may the, rock down. What was the buyback? Dark Banishing, was it Slaughter? I'm trying to remember. That's why you're here. The cost was a lot higher than Murderous That's Cut, what if, you're, I, if memory serves. That's what you're paid to do, man. You know the old cards, I know the new cards. Together, we're unstoppable. Yep. Except for cards in Exodus. I wasn't yeah. playing that. That's the, that's the collective blind slot. Bang. Slightly worse way, Raid the Murderous Cut. <laughs> plus Soul Fire Grandmaster. Buyback for life. That's a lot. That is a lot. That is a lot of life to pay. There's some really expensive buyback costs on some really horrible designs to try to make them happen less often. They were still busted. Flowstone Flood, another good example. One of your favorites. Oh, yeah. It's not an attractive rate, but it still showed up. Looks like Michael Cortez does get game number three over Casey Portis. As per mid-range, one game away from moving on over four-color rally. Looks like it's time for another murderous cut with buyback. Maybe not. Did he make an error here? Uh, oh, he tapped his, I think he tapped his mana wrong. Yeah, he did. He used both of his black mana yep. with the Soulfire Grandmaster to do something. Wow. That could be huge, actually. I don't know. Smith is down to seven, but the way that Smith tapped his mana, he used both his black mana and Smoldering Martian Sunken Hollow for the buyback on the Soulfire Grandmaster. Definitely not what he wanted to do. And now... A little bit under duress here. He's still got a lot of removal spells in hand. And he's got seven life to play with, but the game has gotten a little sketchier now. Well, you take a look at his hand. There's another Jason land and a murderous cut. There's an activation. So this cut will be for three mana plus two delve. Oh, this is a kind of a risky way to do it, though. So, Pitiless Horde's game over? Yep. I mean, there's a lot of draws now. I think that was a Gideon? Gideon's not shabby. Come across for five. And now these murderous cuts with buyback have become expensive because most of his graveyard's gone. And he's not going to be able to flip Jace next turn, most likely, because most of his graveyard's gone. I think for Caleb to get back in this game, he needed Alex Smith to make a mistake. I didn't think he was expecting it to be that mistake. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. I mean, that was a lot of damage that came across last turn and this turn as a result. Smith will draw. It's a copy of Ochtai's command. We'll see how helpful that can be. Two cards in the grave right now, graveyard right now for Alex Smith. Well, he can murderous cut and Ochtai's command this turn. Or over the course of this turn and Schur's turn, mm -hmm. which... That's a lot of life to play with, and that's a removal spell. Jace is going to activate. Time to draw and discard. Mountain's the draw. 
Jace down. That's the third card in the graveyard. Going to make cut even cheaper. There's a mountain. Cut and a mystery card in Alex Smith's hand. We know it's Ocean's Command. Caleb does not. We'll see how Alex recovers from that blunder a little bit earlier. He can still get, he can still get this game. Yes, it's still possible to stabilize from here. And if Schur is respecting Crackling Doom here and not firing up the Gideon and instead making tokens, that could give Smith a lot of breathing space. Shambling vent the draw for Caleb. Which is not a horrible draw here. It's a landfall trigger for the Snapping Gnarlet, which means that uh, the Soulfire Grandmaster can no longer trade. It's also another threat next turn. So as far as lands go, that's one of the better ones. So how to use Gideon? That's the question right now. A lot to think about this turn for Caleb. He might be able to steal this one. In a spot like this, when you're playing against Sky Black, you've seen your opponent activate Jay, some cards in the graveyard, all that stuff, and you know that they play so well at instant speed, it's hard to try to play around everything. Yep. I mean, this is, this is the fairy's experience. Sherrod does not play the land before attacking. How do we feel about that? Uh, I mean, he's, it definitely is a strong representation that the spells in hand, but I don't know if Smith really has the luxury of playing around spells to begin with. My, I liked not playing the land before the wingmate rock because he really needed that raid to occur. Here, I think I would have played the land before combat. I think the extra point is worth more than whatever bluff you're trying to set up. Soulfire Grandmaster getting in front of Gideon. And that is going to do it because of note, when you block a Gideon, you don't deal damage to it. Mm -hmm. So the lifelink will not occur. And Caleb Scherer is going to steal this third game here against Alex Smith. Obzon Agro does win that game over Jeskai Black. And now for Caleb, he's a game away. And you can see the smile and Caleb picking up in his seat a little bit. He knows uh, that one was looking real bad, but two fairly big mistakes there by Smith. And, and now Caleb is up 2-1. Smith's got to win two in a row. And we get to game five, he's got to do it on the draw. Unbelievable. In a game that I thought Alex Smith was running away with. Yes. With how much Murderous Cut was just taxing Caleb's resources. Caleb was able to draw a Gideon right on time. But that activation of Soulfire Grandmaster, the missed tapping, something that Sherry was able to take advantage of. And, I think and he Smith, knows it. Well, I think Smith also might have gotten himself into trouble trying to even beyond that point, try to do just too much with the murderous cut. I think that if he prioritized stabling the board as fast as possible, trying to get that crackling doom out of his graveyard, he might need to draw well, but I think the path he put himself on was just too mana efficient once he fell that far behind on the board. Game number four gonna be underway here between those two. And if I was Caleb, I'd have a smile on my face as well. I feel like I got away with something that game. Game number four gonna be underway in just a second. As far as the players' championship is concerned, we've got 15 players qualified for that thing. It's been a year-long ride for many of them. Jacob Wilson, Jim Davis, they got it done in season number one. Ali Trazi, Kevin Jones in season number two. And of course, Alex Bastecki and Danny Jessup in a season number three. You see the other names that have filled this thing out here. Logan Mize, Tom Ross, Hunter Nance, Rudy Briska, Ross Merriam, Joe Lissette, Todd Anderson, Brad Nelson. One more to go. And we might be having to move on one of these photos. Like I said, Joe Lissette wins this thing. His face goes over that trophy there, that last remaining slot, and either Eric Hawkins or Caleb Scherer fills in that last slot. It's gonna be a heck of a tournament. You see the 15 of the 16 competitors, players championship taking place at the Star City Game Center next year excuse me, next week, December 19th and the 20th, 16 competitors, $50,000. Tough to pick a favorite out of that crowd. It's hard to go against the defending champion over Brad Nelson, who's been already preparing for the weekend. There are some real monsters of multi-format constructed in this tournament. And Todd, Brad, uh, Jacob Wilson really stand out to me as players with no holes in their constructed games. 
And it's funny, you, you take a look at some of those players, or you see a specialist, Joe Lissette, but I think he's shown this year that his game is pretty well-rounded. Yeah, modern is the big blind spot. Yeah. I mean, obviously, four standard open wins at this point, and his legacy resume is also robust. But this was a modern tournament. He made the top eight. So I don't know if he's necessarily going to be playing Tron next weekend, but he's at least shown some proficiency in the format. It all happens next weekend, December 19th and the 20th. StarCityGames.com Players Championship. 16 competitors, $50,000. You and I will be flying back home tomorrow and then back on an airplane Thursday. Well, I'm yeah. driving home tonight. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I forgot. You're local-esque. Four hours. Yeah. Door to door. How boring is that drive through the desert? Is it I bad? love it. Is it? Okay. All right. Love it. Are there... So, okay, I have... I have like, what I like to call movie syndrome, mm -hmm. where it's just, you know, there are tumbleweeds and there are no stops from here until you get there, and so if you run out of gas, you just lose the game. Oh, it's it's kind of depressing. There's a water park that they built out in the middle of the desert, not near anyone, and the cost of getting water there has got to be prohibitive. Yeah. It's just run down, shut down, and it's still there. Okay. I don't believe in ghosts, but that place is haunted. <laughs> it looks like, it looks like a, like a Scooby-Doo <laughs> ghost house, basically. That's the highlight of the trip. Also, the stop in Barstow for, for gas and Carl's Jr. Okay. Is that, is that always a stop for you? Yes. Okay. Fire up some Carl's Jr. It's, it's a desolate drive. That doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad one. It's a drive I want to make at some point in my got life. Got CDs in my car, you know. I got, oh. got my thoughts. There's a lot to go over. <laughs> yeah. A lot to go over. I heard the Springsteen this morning. Yeah. Darkness on the Edge of Town. Pretty good desert drive CD. Caleb going to take a mulligan here. Alex Smith happy with his seven cards. I'm sure, is, is it kind of like when you're driving from, if when you're driving from Los Angeles to Vegas, do you see kind of the Las Vegas skyline as you can kind of approach like, the, like the, the hotels and everything? You do. Okay. You get bluffed the first time because you see the lights on the horizon, you start getting excited, but you just hit prim which is the town right over the California into Nevada border. Oh. The drive to Vegas is another 45 minutes, but I remember seeing the lights and being like, the first time I did the drive, seeing the lights and thinking, this actually seems kind of crappy, but I was just in prim. And ah. Vegas, <laughs> Vegas is a little bit further up the road. Gotcha, gotcha. Just, I see all these lights, and then there's like a sign for an IHOP, and I'm thinking this can't, this can't really be Vegas, right? <laughs> and it wasn't, so there you go. Well, at some stage, I'm sure. That'll be a drive I get to see. You could just drive to Roanoke, too, you know. That's a bit lengthier and more complicated. Yeah. I-15 to I-10 and I'm home. Roanoke, a little bit harder than that. We're underway. Hey, Warden of the First Tree. So that's four for four, I think. I believe that's true. You know, he's mulligan twice, digging for it or whatever, <laughs> but yeah. He might be. Four for four. It's so important to get started that way in this matchup. Alex Smith might be saying, can I catch a break? There's a mountain. Might have a Jace on the way, we'll see. We were pretty stoked when the fetch lines were 10 out of standard. Oh, why is that? I'm going to throw that out there. Why is that? Yeah, I'm a little tired of seeing people shuffle. I value my time, and I value the time of other people. Mm. So I'm <laughs> pretty excited about it. I see. Caleb will draw. We'll see what his second turn brings. I don't know if Smith has missed Jace on two yet. I don't think so. I mean, he's had, he's had something to do on turn two every game, but I think it may have been Jace all four now. He certainly, he certainly hit frequently. Yep. Caleb thinking what land to play. Just a shambling vent, so no way to pump. No attack to be had. We're going to go back over to Alex Smith. Pluto Delta the draw. Roast, Crackling Doom, Soulfire Grandmaster in hand. And this is really the first game where we seem sure have a bit of a mana stumble early on in the game. With Smith being on the play, 
and having Jace on two, I expect him to be able to capitalize this game. Here comes the Warden. Looks like just one point of damage this time. There goes Wooded Foothills. Let's see what Land Caleb wants to search up. No guarantee it's a basic forest here. Will be a little bit of an odd fetch here if he's not trying to do something right now. Although, given his color mana situation, his options are a bit limited. Yeah, it's an awkward color mana situation. Yeah, it's going to be a morph. That's Den Protector. Now over to Alex Smith, we're going to go. So maybe we might see a removal spell here or a Jace activation. Give me a Jace activation on the end step. Time to draw and discard. Soulfire Grandmaster, the draw. Down goes a Grandmaster. Now Jace, along with those lands, will untap. Smith's fourth turn of the game. The draw is a polluted delta. This opens up Smith, I believe, for a Soulfire Grandmaster plus Roast turn if he wants it. I've seen worse turns. Especially with his Jace unchecked here. You don't necessarily have to save the Rose for something like Siege Rhino because you can reasonably expect to get it on the flashback. Well, okay, support as Michael Cortez going to game number five. As Port is able to tie things up. Four color rally, Esper mid range. And the winner of that match, moving to the semifinals, will play the winner of this match as their Soulfire Grandmaster. And I think here comes the Roast. That'll take care of the morph. And Smith will be plus five life. Now Jace will go active. Crackling Doom the draw. Gonna discard Polluted Delta. Jace will flip. Warden. Gonna have very little power, and it's a great start here this game for Smith. Yep. Really capitalize on Schur's first early stumble of the match. Now, Schur is way behind. His deck doesn't really have destroy target Planeswalker available to it. He's got to get Jace off the table ahead of schedule with creature removal. So now Schur looking at multiple removal spells getting flashed back over the course of this game. And Avenza, very quick thumbs up there from Alex. Yep, flashback roast in the graveyard, so no real concern here for Smith. So many different ways to answer it. He'll draw a card now. I believe Ojitai's command was the draw. That's a shambling vent. And now here's a Crackling Doom. Down goes Anafenza. Cher will take two. Smith will gain two. Thanks to the Soulfire Grandmaster. And how about two more? 26 to 14 now the life totals. Jace will take up. Slow the Warden down. And now we had Caleb's way. He has brought in Painful Truths. Not bad for Caleb to draw three here, given how far behind he is on card count, but uh, he's in trouble no matter what. He's going to have to draw very well off of this painful truth the next couple draw steps to get back into this one. Looks like snapping Gnarled, Duress, and Wingmate Rock. Well, Wingmate Rock is one of the better cards that Sure has in the matchup. If you can get that rated, that's a, that's a plan towards something.
There's a canopy vista. Might be snapping Narla time. And now Caleb will pass. That's his entire turn. But at least he's working towards something. He's got a creature in play. Now two creatures in play. Makes it pretty likely he's going to be able to at least get a raid trigger next turn. Now, if he can get the Wingmate Rock to resolve, is a different question. Smith may just be hanging back with Ojasai's command. But the second creature is critical here for sure to try to get towards Wingmate Rock. Jay's going to go up. Looks like it's going to slow down Snappy Narla to allow the Grandmaster to come into the red zone. Huge difference in life totals here. And now Smith is going to pass with a wall of stuff up. Cher is now drawn a copy of Pitiless Horde. The life total is not looking promising for that particular card. I'm inclined to agree. There's Duress. Looking to clear a path, perhaps. We might see a response here from Alex. The hand is Murder's Cut, Crackling Doom, and Ojatai's Command. The goods. They're not bad, that's for sure. Both Ojatai's Command and Murderous Cut with Soulfire Grandmaster in play essentially cover the Wingmate Rock. There goes Ojatai's Command. Snappy Narlet was the target with Jace last turn, so it's a zero power creature right now. Shambling Vent will make it into a one power creature. I thought the Pitiless Horde might be firing up. I don't know if Shura can really run that play into the face of Murderous Cut plus buyback. He might need to spend his mana on something like We Meet Rock to try to get two threats in play and overpower it. Although I suppose that's off the table as well because his land for the turn came into play tap. I also think that Caleb, because he hasn't shown it yet, he might better catch him off guard with a game five, assuming we do go to a game five. Yes. I mean, it's been in his hand several times. Uh -huh. It just hasn't quite come up yet. Den Protector. That'll be face up. Cut with buyback. Seen this song and dance before. Though if this was the route that Schur was going to take, I think I would have preferred to get the, the murderous cut out of hand, play the Den Protector face down, Okay. Hopefully that's good enough to induce the Ojatai's command, and that gives you some shot next turn of getting Waymate Roth to resolve. Sure. As long as Murderous Cut is in Smith's hands, if he's doing other stuff, he's casting spells, he's keeping his graveyard full, the Waymate Rock is not really worth all that much. And a Den Protector might have been enough for Smith to say, okay, I don't really want to leave four man up for the whole game here. I'll cash in my Ojatai's command, get my two for one, and move on. And then you've got a shot at getting Waymate Rock into play. Jace going to move up. Soulfire Grandmaster going to come on in. Den Protector is zero power creature now. Thirty to six. Smith's going to continue to grind him down. Another Soulfire Grandmaster. Over to Caleb. Wingmate Rock appears to be the plan. It allowed him to steal the last game. Don't know if it'll allow him to do it this time. He's in a much bigger hole right now, both in terms of resources 
and life toll than when he was able to get Wingmate Rock to stick in the first game, uh, excuse me, in the previous game. Standard open players that is tied. Active player finish your turn, then play five initial turns. There's Crackling Doom. That's going to take care of snapping Narlin, we believe. I think there was a landfall trigger involved here. A and the debt protector has shrunk anyway. Uh -huh. Oh, so there goes Snappy Narlin. Share her down to four. Here comes Death Protector. Good block. Well, yeah, I, I, sure, just doing this for the ray trigger. Of but, course. Uh, you know. And now Wingmate Rock. It's bringing a friend along. Although I think a flashback of Crackling Doom here leaves sure Dead to rights, I think. Well, he's still, I guess, bluffing a removal spell here, which would be bad news for, for Smith should that come up. So it's worth playing on. Dragon Lord Ocha tied the draw there for Alex. Jade's going to go down, looking to recast something. Old Cracklesworth. Caleb's gonna fall down to two. Al's gonna gain even more life. And Murderous Cut will clear that out, and that's gonna do it. So Alex Smith gonna tie things up here against Caleb Scherer. Just Guy Black, I was on aggro, going to get number five. Not much of a surprise there, if you ask me. Terminate with buyback has proved problematic for the deck <laughs> full of three and four mana creatures. Back to you, Cedric. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat, somewhat difficult. It's, it's proven, it's proven yeah. to be a, a little rough. Yeah. That's why it's just so important for Caleb to get out in front early. And even though I, I initially said, yeah, Painful Truth's coming in, I think the matchup's slow enough. I'm starting to question that. I, I think Caleb can't afford to give a, a turn off early on in the game drawing three cards. Well, of course, his players are playing for a lot here this weekend in Las Vegas. First place, $10,000. 35 Open Series points and an invite to our Season 1 Invitational in Columbus. Finalist, $5,000, 30 Open Series points. And the Open Series points, really, if you think about it, they only play a huge role for Caleb here. But if he wins one more game, the dream is still alive to go to the Players' Championship, which is what he's been trying to accomplish all year long. Yes. Uh, I mean... He has to win this one. That obviously still leaves him eligible to win the entire tournament. If he wins this one and then loses in top four, he can still hope that Joe Lissette wins the whole thing and opens up another at-large bid. But this game is, is step one. This is the important one. And you know, for, for whatever reason, at least for me, I put, a big, I put a big onus on being on the play game five. It just makes me feel comfortable. Oh, you, you can tell the matchup is about Caleb's first couple of turns of the game. Yep. Because once Alex stabilizes the board, he's able to recur removal spells. He's just got more clean two for ones and three for ones. It's hard for Caleb to, to win the game from that spot. Really, his only trumps are Gideon and Wingmate Rock once the game gets to a certain point. Those are really the only cards powerful enough. Even things like Siege Rhino, it's rare to be able to overcome Jeskai Black once the game is slowed down and the Jeskai Black player has enough life to work with. Well, it'll be game number five. It looks like Alex is going to go back to the drawing board just a little bit here. We'll see if Caleb does keep in cards like Painful Truths, Pitiless Horde, some other options. And it's been a fun match to watch so far. Just got Black Ops on aggro, just going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, as they oftentimes do. And one game to decide it all. Winner of this match will play the winner of Michael Cortez and Casey Portes. They are in game number five themselves. Cortez with his Esper mid-range deck, Portis with his four-color rally deck. Keep in mind, after this, we've got the other side of the quarterfinals. It'll be Joe Lissette against Christopher Giuliano. That's five-color bring to light against Red Black Dragons. 
And then Justin Rios with Opsad Agro against Evidianto Ajaya, Esper Dragons. Evidianto, I know that Joe Lissette and, of course, Caleb Scherer, the two big names here in the top eight, but Evidianto Ajaya, a former Grand Prix champion, and he destroyed this tournament. Yes, a lot of open series success to his name as well, previous yep. invitational success. A Grand Prix win in Denver a few years back, which was a legacy. He absolutely destroyed that thing. In first place in the standings through most of day two, very comfortable ride to the top eight. Was locked, I believe, with three rounds to go. Yep. A lot of wiggle room. He's only lost in the Swiss to Jeff Oakland, playing black-white control. Good performance by Jeff Hoagland, by the way. A top 16 finish. Yep. Very nicely done. Jeff coming with some interesting decks this weekend, as always. Black, white control and standard. And then Grixis, Delver, and Modern. Decks that he is fairly passionate about and put up solid records with. Was really great watching him. Uh, I didn't get to watch the match against Vidi, but I also watched him play against Shaheen Sarani in day two. And when you look at black, white decks, not a lot of card advantage, a ton of creature removal in game one. You would just assume your matchup against Control has got to be horrible. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure game one it is. You just got too many dead cards. But post board, it looked like he was able to clean it up and have a very good matchup against decks like Esper post board. And I had to assume that most of his creature matchups are going to be good because he's got a bunch of powerful planeswalkers, wingmate, uh, not wingmate, right, excuse me, secure the wastes, and Gideon and so forth. So And a lot of removal. A lot of removal. Yeah. A lot of removal. If you are just tuning in, it's Cedric Phillips, Patrick Sullivan, Matthias will be joining us soon here in the booth. As we make our way through Elimination Sunday, Caleb Scherer, Alex Smith, that's who you're watching right now. Soon enough, it'll be Joe Lissette and Christopher Giuliano. Vidianto Bajaya, number one overall in the standings here this weekend. Looking to head to his first Players' Championship, potentially win his first Invitational. But right now, the attention is on this match. Hobbs on aggro, just guy black. For Caleb Scherer, if he makes the top four, then he doesn't need to win the tournament to qualify for the Players' Championship. Joe Lissette can drag him there. Right now, for Caleb, this game is his most important one of the tournament. And one could argue for Eric Hawkins, too. Uh, Smith's hand looks to be a bit of a mess. He's got Dragonlord Ojutai, Ojutai's Command, Monastery Mentor, Painful Truths, a couple lands, no early interaction. He's going to send that back. Okay. It's, a, it's a hand of lands and spells, but it's a hand of lands and spells that's not going to be able to keep up if Caleb's got one of his good draws. Down to six, he's going to go. His first mulligan match, sure, with a mulligan in games three and four. Share, as we have noted, four for four with Warden of the first turn, the first turn. So important for him in the matchup. Yep. I mean, he, if he has one drop and a two drop on the play and Smith can interact on turns one or two, that's often going to be too much to overcome. And that can happen with Just Guy Black either missing the removal spells or just having the mana come into play and an inopportune sequence. Six cards here for Smith. We'll see if he's going to keep these. I don't think he likes his hand. It's not a good look. <laughs> no one wants the mulligan to five, but I don't think he likes his hand. He's going to five. I mean, you know, you're always loathed with the mulligan to five, game five on the draw. Yeah. And with the Vancouver rule, I found that, at least for me in a lot of the matches that I've watched, I'm way more, mul way, way more likely to mulligan seven because you have the scry. And also way more likely to keep sketchy six card hands because of the scry. scry. So I think the six card hands that get mulligan nowadays with the new rules have to be quite bad. You don't like to do it, of course, but if you're thinking about it, it probably needs to go back. And if that's your reaction, I think it probably has to go yeah. back too. Time to take a look at five. There's a Rose, there's a Soulfire Grandmaster. I see a Delta, Mystic Monastery. You can play with this hand. Yep. The Scry. He'll consult. He's got a Mystic Monastery and a land that searches for a swamp. So yep. Colored Man is fine. He's got a Rose to interact on two. Soulfire Grandmaster as well. Totally acceptable five card hand. 
that card goes to the bottom here for Alex. Guess what he's playing turn one? Yeah. Five for five for Caleb Scherer. Mystic Monastery passed the turn it's back. It's not my deck to not draw it. That's very true. Pull out Strand, Windswept Heath in hand. He's going to play a Heath. Sacrifice that. Go down to 19. A pump and the beatdowns. Alex Smith will draw. Copy a Smoldering Marsh. You see the hand, there's also a Fiery Impulse over there, so it's a pretty good hand here for Alex, all things considered. It's, it's lands and spells, it's some stuff to do, the colored mana is okay. Uh, five cards on the draw, facing down Ward again, is always going to be challenging, but you could do a lot worse on five cards. See if Smith wants to play this turn. Delta looks to be the land. Now the question is what land he's going to search up, and then the follow-up question is, does he want to play Roast this turn, or does he want to play Soulfire Grandmaster? Self-inflicted wounds in the deck, no surprise there. There's a Swamp. My preference, I think, is for Soulfire Grandmaster. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of removal in the deck on Shurer's side, and the removal that he does have represents his whole turn. And the upside of getting to roast with Soulfire Grandmaster and play next turn, and having more selection over the roast, if Shurer, for example, plays something like Anafenza, uh, to me, I prefer this play. There's the Grandmaster. Shurer will draw. From a tempo perspective, it's unlikely Shurer punishes him too bad. Worst case scenario is Shurer just uses all of his mana killing your Soulfire Grandmaster. You take an extra three points of damage. Here comes the Warden. Smith going to fall down at 13. Shambling vent. Den Protector face up. Kick it over. I love it. The, the risk here with that play, I don't exactly know what's in Shurer's hand, but with Soulfire Grandmaster in play unchecked, if Smith's hand is configured the right way, he can gain a lot of life and drag this game out for a long time. You see Fiery Impulse plus Roast. He can clear out the board here, gain seven, attack, gain two more, go to nine, and Caleb is down one of his best cards for a game that goes on for a long time. Here's an attack for two. Bloodstained Meyer simply passed the turn back. No roast here. Well, Caleb couldn't kill it last time. Pretty safe to assume he can't kill it this time. And Smith would much prefer to kill something like Siege Rhino rather than the Warden. Will holding the roast pay off? Well, he's got, you know, Smith's got a lot of life to work with now. He gained the two from the fiery impulse, he gained two from the attack. I'm willing to take some hits for some flexibility here, especially whenever he decides to pull the trigger on the roast. If he's assuming that Soulfire Grandmaster is just going to be staying in play, that's five more lives. So then you can afford to be uh, very conservative. Well, there's public enemy number one. It's Gideon, ally of Zendikar. It's going to bring along a knight ally. And now Smith's really under the gun on this mulligan to five. Yeah, only one negate here in the 75 to stop with Bloodstained Mire and Swamp uh, at the ready. No hope that Smith could even cast it, even if he had it in hand. He has nothing in his deck to get it off the table other than by grinding through it with removal and burn spells. Uh, if you look at Smith's list, in my opinion, this is the biggest hole in the armor, is this card. And with sure already having some stuff going on and having this on curve with Smith on five cards, it's going to be a tough one to come back from. Sunken Hollow will enter the battlefield tapped from the Bloodstained Mire. We're going back Alex Smith's way. He'll draw a card. It's a copy of Treasure Cruise. Smoldering Marsh and simply pass the turn back. And unfortunately here for Alex, he doesn't even have Crackling Doom at the ready. 
too hard to cast. The mana doesn't line up. So now Caleb has to kind of identify what would Alex be able to do in the situation with the necessary mana. Gideon is not going up right now. This is just an attack for five. It's a Canopy Vista. Knight ally on the way. Standard open players. And now here's Anna Fenzel. And the one thing about Jeskai Black, the one thing that this deck does not have is does not have a mass removal spell. Yep. There's no, I mean, there's Radiant Flames, but I would be shocked if it was in Smith's deck. Not against this deck. <laughs> Crackling Doom, no, no, no. He's not going to be able to cast that card. His mana does not line up correctly. Two black sources and a white and a red. He cannot play it. And if Smith was banking on that, now we we may have hit the point of no return. I think so. He'll draw. Picked up a copy of Ochai's command. That's too expensive to line up right now. Yeah, Smith really needs to start casting two spells in a turn. And even then, he's got to be able to get the Gideon off the table to have any hope of this game going on for a couple more turns. As good as this Jeskai Black mana base can be at times, it can't cast everything all the time. And we just saw it that last turn. And for Smith, if he goes back and watches this, math, this match, it's the mana that's really done him in. Yes. It was the activation of Soulfire Grandmaster with the wrong mana in game number three. It's the inability to cast Crackling Doom and multiple spells a turn in game number five. Well, the games that Smith has won, it didn't really matter if his mana was a little fidgety because he slowed down sure enough to be able to just allow that to happen, develop a little bit slowly, but kill everything on curve. When Sure has put him under pressure and he stumbled with the mana, he has not gotten the wiggle room to, to draw out or get the time to recover from those kind of hiccups. And Sure has had a very aggressive start this game. And that's why starting with Warden has been so important. Yes. You have to get the ball rolling early and put pressure on your opponent. Now here's a roast. Going to target Anna Fenza. Going to gain Smith five life. He's going to go up to 13. But on the table, three, four, five, six, seven, plus five is 12. Okay, so if Sure activates the Shambling Vent and attacks, Soulfire Grandmaster is forced to block, assuming Gideon comes along, as, uh, comes along for the ride. Back over to Caleb. We're going to go. He'll draw. And... Smith is not representing Crackling Doom with the mana he has available. He's only got two. So it's in the clear here for sure to animate the Gideon and attack with that. Crackling Doom is the only concern for going with that line, and Smith can't cast it right now. Caleb curious how many cards in hand. We know the grip here for Alex Smith. It involves Crackling Doom he cannot cast, Treasure Coups that is much too slow to the party, and an Ochai's command. Shambling Vent's not going to go active this turn, it looks like. Gideon is, however, and everything's coming into the red zone. Caleb's hand does have Warden of the First Tree and I believe a couple of lands. Soulfire Grandmaster, as you mentioned, is almost forcing the blocking here. It'll jump in front of a Knight Ally. So eight damage will come through. Smith's gonna fall down to five. That Knight Ally is down. The follow-up here is painful truths. Not a bad time to take a turn off. Yep. Get some more cards. I think I would have had a preference for this pre-combat. Influence your decisions a little bit. Find a removal spell. Mm -hmm. Here comes the Warden. Pass that turn back. Smith going to draw. It might be his last draw of the weekend. We'll see. Monastery Mentor is what he's found. Uh, he can cast one spell this turn, and none of the spells catch him up enough. Four life's not enough. I guess he can gain four life and get a chump blocker back. 
that's still going to be pretty tough. Cher will untap. He'll draw. He just gassed back up. Den Protector, I believe, the draw now. Couple of lands in hand in Shambling Vent and Lanawar Ways. He saw Caleb not activate the Warden of the First Tree on the end step. Maybe a little worried about a card like Fiery Impulse or Wild Slash. Of course, Crackling Doom has to be on the radar. Caleb saw it. Mm -hmm. But if Crackling Doom is the play... Lethal's still coming across. Absolutely. Shambling Vent going to be fired up. With enough mana to activate the Warden that has not been activated yet this turn. He can sense it. As now everything's going to come across in the red zone. So from a life preservation perspective, I think the best thing Smith can do is gain four and get back Soulfire Grandmaster as a chump blocker. But I still don't think that gets him enough. If he blocks the Gideon, he goes to nine, and there's ten points coming across from the other unblocked creatures. Ochtai's command is going to be gain four life, go up to nine. You mentioned if he does block the Gideon, he's not going to get lifelink from that. And if he blocks one of the Wardens, it's the same net of saving five damage. Mm -hmm. It's either five or three plus two, and I just don't think there's a route now. Caleb says you may block. Alex will do the math, see if there's a block that does save him here. But it does, look like that, does not look like that's going to be the case. The highest he can go is to 11. And to go to 11, that means Gideon gets through, which means you go down to six. And it looks like it'll just be enough for Caleb Sherrod to cross the finish line. Yeah, there's every block saves five points of damage at, at the best. And you see Caleb explaining that, and that is going to do it. Caleb Scherer is going to win this match here over Alex Smith. Three games to two. Obs on aggro is going to take care of Jeskai Black. And for Scherer, the player championship dream is still alive. Yep, step one, he's in the top four. Still alive to win the whole thing. And even if he fails to win the next round or the round after that, he still has the hope of Joel Lissette winning the whole thing.